something that is quite common to hear in Christian circles is this concept of mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. And in fact, working in the short-term missions arena, I hear it all the time because people experience this mountaintop experience on the mission trip. And then when they get back to everyday life, there is always inevitably a moment of being in the valley. And so we're going to talk today a little bit about how the spiritual disciplines help us to kind of level out between the both. Stay tuned. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org. And for a limited time, I'm offering all of my podcast listeners a special discount of 20% off. You can use the discount code hearing Jesus. That's one word, all caps, to get your discount. There are also some free videos and a leader's guide for you to get started. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today is day three of exploring this introduction to the spiritual disciplines and kind of just laying the groundwork of why we need to pursue the spiritual disciplines to enable us to get to a place of maturity in our spiritual lives. And so today we're talking about this concept of the mountaintop and the valley experience. And that is a pretty common thing that you hear from believers. In my world, I hear it all the time. And in fact, I I knew one individual that repetitively was going on several expensive mission trips a year. Uh, And I'm talking like the ones that we go to Africa, they're, you know, three, $4,000 pre-pandemic, they'd be three or $4,000 a piece and would use all of their vacation time just to go on these trips. And I, I remember having this conversation with them. I said, not that I, I mean, I'm a big proponent of mission trips, but I said, why are you feeling so called to go on all every single trip that we're offering. And they said, well, I experience God on the trips. And when I'm home, I don't. And so that started this whole conversation about understanding the difference between the mountaintop and the valley. And the way, the reason we get that kind of phrase or that phrasing is it's coming from scripture when it talks about the different kinds of mountaintop experiences where there is a direct communication or interaction with God and an individual. So um, the testing of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 was a mountaintop experience. Uh, the receiving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 was a mountaintop experience. Today we're going to look at the scripture 
from Matthew 17, which is the transfiguration, which is a mountaintop experience. Because I felt like once you have a mountaintop experience with Jesus, that's paramount, right? And for most of us, if we experience that, everything else in our lives would be would pale in comparison. So we're going to take a little bit of a look at that. And then we're going to kind of digest what it means to kind of, I don't want to say bounce back, but to kind of learn how to live in the places that aren't such a high mountaintop type experience. So I'm going to start in verse 17. Again, I'm sorry, chapter 17. This is Matthew. And I'm going to do verses 1 through, I think, about 13. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he transfigured before them. And if you don't know what transfigured means, he appeared before him is just an easier way to think of that. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So think about this with me for a moment. You have Jesus, Moses, and Elijah in their glorified state appearing to Peter, James, and John on this mountaintop experience. So verse four, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Then the disciples heard this. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, the Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. So, Essentially, what we have here is this experience in their humanness. Peter, James, and John have experienced this situation where they not only saw Jesus, but they saw Moses and Elijah, and they heard God's audible voice. So if that's not a mountaintop experience, I don't know what it is. And so I thought that was a really good example because then we have to look at this example of Peter, James, and John and how they lived their normal lives the re the rest of the time. Um, this week... We uh, just got back. My my daughter graduated from uh, high school. She was a valedictorian. And to celebrate her, we took her on a trip, her, a grad trip to Rome. The kids each get to choose uh, one trip that we kind of save for for about three or four years to be able to take them on a trip to kind of just broaden their worldview. And so she chose Rome. And so one of the things that we did when we were in Rome is... We visited the Maritime Prison, and the Maritime Prison is, it's widely held that, is it, that this is the belief that scholars believe that this is where um, both Peter and Paul were held before their, before their deaths. Um, and so the Maritime Prison used to be an underground cistern that would collect water. And so when we had the opportunity to visit, we went down basically this dungeon beneath this church. And at the very bottom of this dungeon, it's a very small room. I mean, it's less than the size of my bedroom that I'm in right now. It's a very small room. And because it used to be a cistern, there was a hole or like kind of a dugout in the, in the floor. And occasionally water would rise up out of the floor. And so when you hear in scripture talking about um, Peter and Paul, them baptizing other prisoners and the prison guards, they were using the water that was rising up out of this hole. And you can still go to this place. It's in Rome. It's in the city center, not far from where um, they were killed. And I, I think one of the things that was so eye-opening for us is realizing that there was a moment in Peter's life, you know, we can see this in the life of Paul as well, but there was a moment in Peter's life where he was on this mountaintop experience where he walked with Jesus daily and he witnessed amazing, incredible things. And then also 
shortly before his death, this moment where he was held in this prison. And yet he still served God. And yet he still continued to hold firmly to the faith because of his relationship with God. And it was such a clear impact for me. Um, again, that is where Paul wrote Philippians on uh, joy, the whole joy chapter. We we talk about Philippians often being the joy chapter, yet he was in this dungeon prison. Um, you know, it would just gave some perspective, not just to us, but to our daughter. And so I think one of the reasons why we pursue spiritual disciplines is because there has to be a place where we are no longer dependent on our emotions, but we are dependent on our relationship with God. We develop a deeper relationship with God. And, you know, I don't know if this has been your experience, but for a lot of people, and we alluded to this yesterday, after they've been a Christian for four or five years or even longer, sometimes they get to a place where they don't necessarily sense God's presence like they used to. And so they attempt to fix that with all sorts of things. Um, the, the person I re referred to earlier, they did it by going on lots of missions trips because they felt connected to God on those trips. And absolutely, we sense and see God's presence in, in some powerful ways on those trips. But beyond that, um, people try to fix their relationship with God, so to speak, in lots of different ways that aren't necessarily fruitful or helpful. Sometimes it can even be destructive. For me, I did it with serving. And so because I had experienced God very real in, in the areas that I was serving, my sense was just that if I would continue to serve, I would have a similar experience with God the way I did before. And so the danger becomes not knowing how to live in the valleys in between these mountaintop experiences and then only living for the mountaintops. Um, and so for me, becoming almost like addicted to serving, there was consequences for that. And yes, there were some good consequences. People were saved and healed and families were restored. But the consequence of that was my own um, neglecting of my, my, maybe my family or my marriage or my own um, mental and emotional health. I talked about that a little bit yesterday when we talked about the things that contribute to burnout. It was definitely something that continue, contributed to burnout for me. And so what we have to learn is that it's not that he isn't present in the valleys. We just need to learn how to recognize him in the valleys. And that's part of what the spiritual disciplines do. They help set us up to learn how to not only interact with the Holy Spirit in the valleys, but to recognize his voice, his presence in those moments when we don't necessarily feel it. Sometimes what happens is people will blame this feeling of not feeling close enough or as close as they used to with God. They will blame this on their pastors or the preaching instead of recognizing that the issue is their own relationship with God. And yes, of course, our pastors contribute to spiritual growth in our lives, but the primary responsibility of our spiritual health rests on us. It's determined on our actions and our behavior and our intentionality in our relationship. And I think it's a lot like our relationship with our spouses. Um, in the beginning, a lot of people experience just that feeling of butterflies and infatuation. But eventually, that changes to a deeper relationship that is based on character and a friendship, and a back-and-forth relationship of giving and serving. And it's cyclical, and we, we will probably get into some things like the love languages and, and things like that down the road, for sure. But my relationship with my husband now, 13 years in, is drastically different than what we had at the beginning. We had a very fun, exciting courtship, and we, in fact got married in a helicopter, um, and we still do things like that. We still have fun. We just took a trip alone together just a couple months ago, just the two of us, and we still have a ton of fun. 
But now I know him to be compassionate and loyal and tender and selfless. And we've faced hard things together. And we've learned how to dig deep together when things got hard. And we've had so many difficult conversations. And we're committed to figuring it out, even if we disagree on something. And so in any long-term relationship, even friendships, ones that you have been in long term, you know, 20 plus year friendships look a lot different than the new friendships that you have. And there's a reliability there and they know you differently. They've seen your good, bad, bad and ugly, and you can be yourself in a different way than people you just met. And in fact, um, I mentioned our trip to Rome. We, you know, walked uh, we just are not people that normally do this. We had walked like 10 miles the one day. So if you go to Rome, make sure you have good shoes. But my feet were just aching after walking 10 miles that day. And my sweet husband, I had taken a shower and my sweet husband um, started to rub my feet. And because we had been walking and it was, it's super hot in the summertime in Rome. But anyway, um, because we had been walking so much and I had these stanky shoes on that I had sweated in a ton, even though I had showered, my feet were still really stinky and my sweet husband not only continued to rub my feet but he he put his mask on in Rome you still have to wear masks on transportation so he grabbed one of his masks and he put his mask on and he rubbed my feet and I I we just were laughing my daughter was laughing at us and she was like oh my goodness and I said you know what that's a mark of a good a good husband I said you know he'll he'll even put on a mask to rub your feet and I just had to chuckle because our relationship is so much different there was a day where I would not have dared allowed him to touch or smell my feet you know after a stinky you know 10 mile day but not only was he willing to do it he was willing to do what it takes in order to serve me and I thought man that's such a clear picture for me of this deep relationship that is different now than it used to be and so again, the disciplines, the goal of the disciplines are to drive you to a place of growing in your maturity, in your relationship with God. And that will look different than how it is when you are a newer believer. So let's go ahead and let's pray and we'll get into more of that tomorrow. God, thank you so much for my friends that are still willing to learn how to lean into this relationship with you. God, I pray that you would even now begin to start to reveal to them the way that you are calling them to a deeper relationship, as deep calls to deep, like we talked about yesterday. God, I thank you for the way that you pursue us and you call us into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, I pray that that would be the desires of their heart, that they would learn through this series how to have a sustaining relationship with God that is not based on their emotions or the mountaintops, but that they would learn how to recognize you in the valley. Lord, I thank you for your presence and your desire to call us to a deeper experience of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Talk to you tomorrow, guys. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.